Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the uh, second in this series of uh, workshops at uh, the Building Department and the Mayor's Office of Earthquake Safety Implementation uh, Committee um, are putting uh, on around the city. Uh, this morning, uh, we're going to have Tom Hui, the Director of the Department of Building Inspections, uh, make some opening remarks, and then uh, he will in introduce you to the other members of our uh, panel who are here to answer your questions primarily. So with that, Tom, would you do the honors, please? Good morning, everyone. Thank you to come to this uh, second series of our soft story program. Uh, we call this as a workshop. Uh, late last meeting, the first meeting we had, you know, I promise you to have uh, these second meetings, but that may not be the last one. We may be thinking about in the future, we have another one with uh, more people will be interested to, you know, find out the program, understand a bit more. Um, today, our program is starting this way. Um, first of all, before that, I want to introduce you the panel here. Uh, on my left, the first one is our best friend, uh, the director of earthquake safety, Patrick Oderini, and then the, on his left is uh, Sandy from uh, Rambord, in case you have some question to ask her. And then the final, is not last, is uh, Robert Chung, my manager of handling all the soft story program regarding uh, plan check or inspection you want to ask get his phone number, you can call him directly. Or you can call me too, okay? Uh, I know this soft story program look very complicated, but actually should be very simple. Anything you need help can come to our department. We have, you know, uh, Spanish or Chinese or, you know, second, you know, uh, people cannot speak English, then we can help them. Even you have trouble with the form, you can come to our first floor counter. We can help you to see how we can help. Uh, before we start the program, I want to just, just don't be shy. I want to see how many people are owner here. Quite a bit, okay. Then how many are professional? They may be trying to find jobs here, right? <laughs> how many are contractor? Okay, that's uh, during the course of our first meeting and other you know, outreach program I had, lots of people asked me that question. How should, you know, the engineer, uh, they need to be registered in California? I say yes, they need to be registered in California. The contractor also need to be registered in California and then make sure they are licensed and have insurance for your protection. Because you know, this is very important in the state of California. If they don't have insurance, the liability go back to the owner. Uh, and for myself, you know, like I mentioned again, I want to make the program more successfully. And then uh, we have uh, October 23rd, have the you know, finance workshop just about more than 1,000 people there. And then I'm thinking about if we necessary to have another series of meeting or workshop, maybe at night to help people, you know, uh, don't need to take off work to come to this kind of workshop. Uh, we, uh, now I want to give the podium to my manager, uh, Robert Chung, to give you some presentation you know, go over the program. Thank you. Oh, oh, Patrick first? Okay, sorry. Patrick first, okay, for say something. Yeah, yeah sorry. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, can everybody hear me okay? 
Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, SFGTV, who is uh, videotaping this today. Um, if you could please spread the word. We've heard from many people that making an event, as Tom mentioned, during the daytime, uh, we understand that you're giving up valuable time of your day, so we appreciate you taking the time to be here. But also, this is going to be uh, recorded and posted online. Um, so that way, uh, if you talk to people that are interested in what we're covering today, this should be available on both the Department of Building Inspections website and uh, the Earthquake Safety Implementation Program's website shortly in a few weeks. Um, I wanted to start by saying, why are we doing this? Um, you know, I think that's something that, that we've, been, we've been caught up in the moment of, of everything that's happening with property owners getting notice of this requirement. Um, I wanted to back up a little bit and just give some context. Uh, coming out in 1989, uh, we saw significant damage, and uh, that was a moderate earthquake. That was not a major earthquake. And after 1989 Loma Prieta, we saw that more than 50% of the units that were uninhabitable in San Francisco were these soft story buildings. And when I say that, I'm not trying to tell you that you own a dangerous building. Um, you may have received this notice and your building may be fine. Um, I think the important part here is to engage with an engineer, a qualified professional, um, whether that's an architect or an engineer, that knows what they're looking at. And this is a good time for you to bring them through your building and take a look at this and, and understand, you know, am I one of these buildings that we're talking about here? So the idea is, is that we've sent out these notices that require screening. You have one year to submit those, and Robert will go into the, the details of the program uh, after I'm finished here. Um, but the idea is that this, this is going to finally determine if you do need to do that upgrade, or if your building's fine as is. We've created several different options as you go through this process, where if you have a, a building that legitimately should not be in this program and already meets the requirements of the standard, that you should be able to opt out of this and not have to do any additional work. Um, that's part of the reason why there's no fee for submitting the screening form. Um, unfortunately, though, uh, obviously engaging your own professional would be part of it. So what we've decided to do is I've, I've talked to many people that, that want to have other events where we're engaging contractors, where we're engaging engineers. Um, as Tom mentioned, last Wednesday we had a very successful finance workshop over in Fort Mason with almost a thousand folks, about 15 of our private banks that have partnered with us, as well as information on the city's existing green finance program run by the Department of the Environment. Um, this is a very interesting program and uh, you're welcome to check it out right now on the Department of the Environment's website. We are right in the process of adapting this to be able to issue loans for both voluntary and mandatory seismic retrofits. So I encourage you that if you haven't already, in the back um, by the front entrance, there's a, there's a sign-up sheet that says, yes, I'm interested in learning more about green finance. So we will go ahead and compile those email addresses and reach out to you. Um, what I'm thinking about doing, and actually what we've been talking about doing for some time, is creating some events where we can have engineers, contractors, and everybody involved in this together in one room. Um, I've been getting so much interest about this that I think we're going to do a much larger event than originally planned. So um, the, way, the best way to find out about that is in the back. Uh, maybe, many of you maybe picked up these postcards right here. It says Soft Story on them. On the back, there's a website address. It's www.sfcaps.org, and that's sfcaps.org. If you go to that home page, uh, right on the left side of the screen, there's an easy way to sign up for our email list. And uh, we will be notifying everybody on that list of any events that we have coming up in the future. So a uh, great way to stay involved and understand what's going on. Um, some other events, uh, as I mentioned, that, um, that we'll be having soon is uh, other workshops to help people deal with the understanding of this. Uh, many of you who are in the engineering profession are familiar with the work that Seonk does. They've dedicated their entire fall seminar to understanding uh, the standards of this retrofit, so when people really want to get into the weeds of the engineering, that's a perfect event for you to attend. And also we want to do as much outreach as possible. So if we're not covering something that you'd like to see, please, please make it aware and bring it to our attention. Um, at the end of this, we're going to have a significant portion of time dedicated to doing questions and answers. Um, I'd like you, again, I, mentioned, I made this, this comment at the last meeting as well, um, we'd like to keep these very general questions about the ordinance. Um, if you have a very unique situation with your particular building, um, please talk to us directly. Maybe it's not worth, worth talking about to the whole crowd here, but we do want to cover as much bases, as many of the bases as possible. So please feel free to come up with your questions, and if something uh, that you didn't get a chance to ask today is still burning in your mind, please feel free to contact me directly uh, or contact uh, Robert and his team over the Department of Building Inspection. Um, and with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to uh, Robert Chun. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Robert Chun. I'm the manager of the Soft Story Program. I wanted to follow up with Patrick. Why do you think we have a Soft Story Program? My answer has always been Loma Prieta, short and simple. Do you guys remember how many people got hurt in Loma Prieta? 4,000 people got hurt. Do you know how many buildings we lost? 1,500 
in the San Francisco Bay Area. 70 of those buildings were in the Marina District. And if I were to put a dollar amount on the damage, $6 billion in property damage. That's why we have a soft story program. Now, over the last four months, I've talked to a lot of building owners, and these questions keep coming up, and I'm gonna to try to answer them for you today. When is my building in the program? How does my building become exempt? How much time do I have to do the retrofit? What tier am I in? How do I submit and complete the screening forms? So those are excellent questions, and I'm gonna to try to answer them for you today. Now, if you look at this building, if you have a wood frame building permitted for construction before 1978 with five or more residential units, three stories or two stories over basement, you are in the program. So this summarizes what I just said. Now, if you've gone through a seismic retrofit, if you look at the last part of the paragraph, that's one of the ways that your building becomes exempt from the program. So here are some facts about earthquakes. We lost 16,000 housing units in the Loma Prieta earthquake. You guys know the probability of the next major earthquake in the San Francisco Bay Area? 60%. There's a 60% chance we'll have a major earthquake within the next 30 years. Within the state of California, there's a 90% chance of a major earthquake. That's why we have this retrofit program. So in September, we sent out 6,000 notices along with the screening forms. You They're pretty easy to fill out, but we do ask, like Patrick said, we do ask that you have an engineer or an architect fill out the forms. We want somebody with a professional education and training to be able to identify a soft story building. That's why we're asking for an engineer or an architect to fill out these forms. Section one is pretty, pretty simple. You know, the owner's name, address, phone number. Now, section two is where if you did a previous retrofit, this is how your building becomes exempt. One building owner came in about four weeks ago. She bought a building in the Richmond district about in 1988. 1988. After she purchased her building, her, her real estate agent and her, and her contractor said, you might have a soft story condition. She chose not to do a retrofit because she had just spent a lot of money purchasing the building. 1989, the earthquake came. Her building suffered a lot of damage. She lost a lot of rent. She had to spend a lot of money retrofitting her building. She came in with her engineer. They brought the plans and the calculations. We reviewed it, and her building became exempt. Other building owners have come in with their engineers. They have demonstrated to us with documentations their building is not wood frame, for example, or they don't have a target soft story. As a result, they have also become exempt from the program. Now, if you are in the program, you will be placed in one of four tiers. And let me talk about the tiers real fast. Okay, you're in tier one, excuse me. You're in tier one if you have assembly, education, or any of the residential care occupancies in your building. You're in tier two if, you're, if you have 15 or more units. You're in tier three if you're not in tier one, two, or four. And then finally, you're in tier four if you have commercial occupancy on the first floor or if you're in the liquid fraction area. If you're in tier one, you have two years to submit the drawings, four years to complete the work. If you're in tier two, you have three years to submit the application. Five, whoops, two, four, because you just add. Okay, five years to complete the work. If you're in tier three, you have four years to submit the application and six years to complete the work. And finally, if you're in tier four, you have five years to complete, to submit the applications and seven years to complete the work. And then this is section five of the screening form. Again, we ask that your engineer or your architect stamp the drawings here. So you can send, their, 
send the screening forms to us by US mail. You can email it to us. You can bring it in, in person. I wanted to introduce two of our staff in the back, Derek and Susie. Can you, can you raise your hand? They're the two hardest working <laughs> staff we have. If you have any questions, they're on the first floor counter. They're on the first floor counter. You can submit the forms to them. And then finally, the last thing I want to talk about is the permitting process. These projects are very important to us. We want, we offer an over-the-counter permit process. That means if your drawings and applications are complete, we give you a permit on the same day. So you start on the first floor, we'll check it for completeness, and then you come up to the fifth floor and we'll do the plan check right in front of you. But we ask that you bring your engineer or your architect so we have any questions, we can deal with it at the same time. I think I wanted to introduce two more of my staff here, Chu and Matt. Are you here? Chu, who is Matt? Okay. You know, most likely it will be Chu, myself, or Matt plan checking it. So that's why I wanted to introduce you to them. So let, let me end by saying this. Do you guys know how much energy is released in a major earthquake? Yeah, I, I read it you know, online. They said in a major earthquake, there's enough energy to power the United States for five days. That's how much energy we're talking about in a major earthquake. So thank you. Thank you so much for being here today. That concludes my presentation. So <clears throat> primarily we want to hear your questions and we have this floor microphone over here at the bottom of this aisle. Uh, if uh, any of you do have questions, uh, please just step up to the microphone and then someone from the panel will happily address uh, the questions that you have. So with that, uh, if we have any questions, please come forward. My name is Lee Murphy. Um, I was at your meeting last week and there were a lot of people there I guess you said a thousand people, but it was all about financing. And people like myself who know I'm ready to go into the program, that really didn't matter. I just need to know what I need to do. And I, I was wondering if you would start with a list of architects and designers and engineers who are acceptable, who've, who've notified your group that they want to participate in this, I could start the process right now. I could have some people come out, put it in the free market sort of system and say, Come out and tell me what you can do. How much do you think I need, and how much will it cost to have your services to prepare this for me? So I just, I'm just looking at it as how do you expedite it? I'm hearing about more and more meetings. Last week's meeting was before the fact or maybe not, not useful to me. So I don't want to get in a whole bunch of meetings. I want to comply. I, know my, I don't want my building to fall down. So I just want you to expedite it by giving me a, a group of people that I can call, have them look at my building and pick one that makes the most sense and is most affordable to me, that's all. That, that's an excellent question. We're keeping a list of all the engineers, architects, and contractors who have come to these meetings. We'll post it online and, and, and you, and, and you f feel free to contact them. They're, you know, they're excellent resources for you. Uh, in, in addition to that, um, just in case you wanted to take action on that today, um, what we've been t telling people, obviously we have a, a liability concern if, by recommending particular architects, engineers, and contractors because we can't guarantee to a ex certain extent um, you know, who they are. And it's a long story, but um, what we have been telling people what you can do right away is you can look through some of the reputable groups in town. Um, look at AIA, look at SEONC. These are the, um, SEONC stands for the Structural Engineers Association of Northern California. On their website, they have a list of their members that are engineers and what they spend specialize in. And so what I tell people is I think the, the most important thing is finding a team of people that you trust and that you feel comfortable with. In addition to that, you want to make sure that they have experience doing seismic retrofits of this nature and experience working in San Francisco. Um, if, they're, if they haven't worked in the city, I would be, I would be very skeptical because this is, we have a different type of housing stock here and you want to make sure that the people who are doing the work are very well qualified. But to answer that question about the website, uh, if you haven't been to the DBI website, it's www sfdbi.org uh, and I believe Patrick is also going to be on the CAPS website which is www.sfcaps.org and there's a slash for soft story. 
So both of those websites have a lot of information uh, on them already, and if you haven't visited them, I do encourage you to do so. Thank you. Next question. I guess my question would be addressed to this young lady here. You're with the rent board, right? I am. Uh, I'm, I, I want to know what my obligations are to tenants that I may have to move uh, while this work is being done, and I want to know uh, what pass-through provisions there are for, uh, well, you know what a pass-through provision is. <laughs> Those are my two questions. Okay, I'm going to start with the easy question, which is the pass-through provisions. Um, in 2002, the rent ordinance was amended to allow landlords who are required to perform seismic work by law to pass through 100% of the cost to their tenants. It's amortized over 20 years, and if you finance your work, you're also entitled to the actual interest up to 10%, and if not, we provide an imputed interest rate. There's an application procedure that must be followed after the work is completed. You have to file your petition for certification of capital improvement costs within five years after you finish the work. I, I had heard some of, of what you just said, but I also heard that a tenant uh, needs only write a letter of hardship to be relieved of that, and then the, and then the landlord gets stuck again. Is that true? <laughs> um, recently, the Board of Supervisors has amended the rent ordinance again to provide specific hardship provisions for capital improvement pass-throughs. And uh, the provisions are going into effect next Monday. They do allow tenants to apply to the rent board for deferral or relief from the capital improvement pass-through if they're on a fixed income from um, something like general assistance or SSI, um, types of public assistance for needy families. Also, if tenants gross income of the household is, I think, 80% of the uh, median income for this area, and if their rent with the pass-through would comprise, if their income would comprise 30% of the rent, then they could also apply for deferral. And finally, tenants who have extraordinary circumstances, such as extensive medical bills, might also apply. So Are there any hardship provisions for owners? <laughs> <laughs> you might be surprised to learn this, but there are actually landlord hardship provisions. Um, but I'm not sure that it would necessarily defeat a tenant's claim of hardship. There might be a balancing of the equities. Um, should that situation arise. But when we do consider landlord hardship, we don't just look at your cost for the particular building that you own, but we look at your entire, um, your entire income stream, which may include other properties as well. To address your other question, what to do about tenants who may need to relocate. The first thing I can tell you, and I know you're not gonna wanna hear this, is that you probably should talk to an attorney who specializes in San Francisco eviction and rent control laws. Um, hopefully, the most you'll have to do is ask tenants to vacate your ground floor, which would be your garage or parking. And um, if you do that, there are a couple of current proposals to amend our ordinance, again, that are floating and should probably be available by the time you're ready to do the work. Um, you would at least have to reduce the tenant's rent for the cost of them parking somewhere else during the work or um, what we call a commensurate rent reduction. So um, if they have to vacate their units while the work is taking place, you actually need a just cause for eviction, which would be one of our um, temporary evictions for capital improvements and relocation payments are required. If you're gonna ask them to vacate for less than 20 days, then there's a state law which significantly reduces the cost of relocation expenses. Well, I know you don't want specific things, but that one bedroom unit, my building, get, you know, they pay me $400 a month because of this damn rent control law. So that's supposed to be reduced now more. If, if they're paying, if you they correct. have parking, is that what you're saying? No, no. If you're gonna relocate them. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying you have to reduce their rent. I'm just saying you may have to pay relocation expenses. Uh, I, 
I if you have to temporarily that four hundred dollars a month. And if I, uh, just to help you address that question, there, sir. Um, as you can imagine, we started looking at this issue more than 10 years ago. Uh, we looked at a wide range of options on how we wanted to deal with these buildings. And obviously, if you were to do a full seismic retrofit of the building, that would involve work throughout the entire building and relocating tenants. That's not what this ordinance requires. That's why, overwhelmingly, when we talked to public groups like this, we heard that a partial retrofit was something that made people happy because it kept tenants in place. It wasn't moving them out of their units, and it was keeping the work limited to the ground floor. And in the case of parking, you know, I know this is going to come up, but we, we've seen some great Great examples of, of landlords working with their tenants where they've been able to you know go to work during the day take their car whatever their situation is when their car is not on the garage in the garage and schedule the work around there and, um, and we'd like to encourage that type of cooperation between the landlords and the tenants we all know it's very difficult but uh, we can all get through this together so that's uh, just a, a little parting advice to you I'm sorry I just in full disclosure I do need to follow that up there is currently a restriction in the rent law for taking away someone's parking without having a just cause for eviction. And I think the Board of Supervisors is working to address it so that it might not apply in this situation, but there is nothing on the books right now. Um, so like Patrick says, trying to work something out with your tenants is probably the best way to go for now. Uh, you've addressed the issue as far as uh, uh, pass-through for capital improvements. Now what about the other expenses for uh, the pre-inspection, the design work, the, uh, the rent uh, reduction, and relocation expenses? Are those also available for pass-through? Okay, the relocation expenses cannot be passed through to the tenants. And any rent reductions for asking people to vacate their parking during the work is also not subject to pass-through. But the pre-inspection, pre the engineering costs, the architect costs, all of those would be included as part of your capital improvement pass-through costs. Thank you. Okay. Uh, could you explain what target story is in Section 3? Sure, I'd be happy to. Actually, um, we, we are blessed here by our resident engineer who helped design the program, uh, uh, David Bonowitz, who uh, has been working on this effort for very many years. David, why don't you come up here and, and explain uh, the target story concept and how it was a, a good solution to this problem as we were developing the, the ordinance. Thank you, Patrick. It's a good question. I would. Uh, my first answer is when you got the screening form in the mail, you also received a set of the screening form instructions, and they have a full description with a definition and a worksheet and examples of pictures that describe what a target story is uh, and how to figure out if you have one. And you don't have to do it because your engineer will figure that out as well. But to get to your question, the reason we had to develop this concept of the target story was that uh, if you just look at the plain language of the ordinance, it says all wood frame buildings. But we know that that was gonna capture a lot of buildings that was never actually intended to be part of this program. This program is really focused on certain buildings that we know or strongly suspect have certain deficiencies. So if you have a building that is top to bottom, the same layout of all the same rooms, it might be wood frame, it might be pre-1978, it might be three stories and five units, but it's not the building we're looking for. So we invented the target story idea to make sure that during the screening process, we only find the buildings that we're looking for, and we think that's going to exempt uh, a lot of buildings. Uh, even though we can't say that those buildings are great seismically, they're just not the ones that we, they're not the really bad ones that we're trying to find with this program. So that's where the concept came from. And if you want to talk details more about how the definition works, please see me later. Thank you. This may be a little redundant, but uh, the notices that were sent out on the 15th of September, you said there were 6,000 sent out. Is, does that identify all the buildings that you're targeting in this program? Are there other buildings that you haven't found that three years later you say you should have been in it? Even if you didn't receive a notice, you're still under, uh, you know, you're still under, you still have to follow the regulations of the ordinance. Yeah. As soon as we find out the building, then the the time will start ticking. But if you didn't receive a notice, you're still under the obligations of this ordinance. How do you know? With the definition of this target story, is that the key concept here? I, I, would, I would start with the, the more broader issues. If you're three stories, five units, pre-1978, think of yourself as in, if it's a wood building in any way, and then you can have an engineer or somebody else come out and confirm that you're not. But to your, your first question, I know of a couple of buildings that did not receive a notice, but they are definitely supposed to be part of this program. 
So it does happen. There ought to be a better way to figure that out rather than have the individual owner responsible for the whole thing in, in terms of the technical identification of engineering requirements. Seems to me that you guys have got the professionalism to develop a firm list rather than waiting three years and say, gee, you're in the program. Well, actually, we don't, but I'll... Yes, thank you. Um, great question. And, and actually, as you can imagine, you're not the first person to bring up that point. However, uh, when, when Mayor Newsom was office, and furthermore, when, when Mayor Lee took office, we've workshopped this many times talking to property owners. And overwhelmingly, we heard from property owners that they wanted to have control of this process. They wanted to be able to decide which engineer they were selecting, uh, who they were bringing into their building, the thought of uh, building inspectors coming into their building to uh, assess the, the building's structural integrity, uh, made property owners very nervous. So it wasn't even a, a question when we put it to a vote in a group of property owners. It was almost overwhelmingly uh, in favor of let us take the responsibility, us being the property owners, and screen this building ourselves with our team. I'm in favor of the program. I think, you know, obviously we're going to have an earthquake. It's just a question of when. <laughs> obviously, if we do this to the buildings, it improves it from a safety standpoint, also from an investment standpoint. If you can pass through a reasonable amount of these costs, we're not going to lose a lot of dollars. All of these dollars are government deductible, so we have a, another partner that's in this thing that's not in the room today. I'm just concerned about buildings that three years from now, will these same kind of schedules, if you found a building three years from now that should have been here this morning, will you have those four-year periods or five-year periods or six-year periods to comply? The intention is we don't want people to be able to try to skate the system. So the timelines are firm. However, uh, the billing department does have the um, the, the jurisdiction to be able to make a call if there's an unusual circumstance and the timelines need to be extended. But for the time being, we're saying that these, hard these are hard deadlines to meet. I realize that you have a liability if you have a laundry list of people that you say are acceptable to do these inspections or do the engineering work. But we need, it seems to me you need some guidance or somebody has to come up and say, we've used these people, they're familiar with San Francisco, they're not coming in from someplace else even though they're licensed in California. I think we need to zero in on that professional group that somebody can say the most important thing that I see is I'm going to fix the building. I want the guys that inspect it know what they're doing, and I want an honest contractor not to pad the bill. Are there ADA requirements that haven't been addressed that are involved in this program as well? So just to restate the question, in case you didn't hear it, it was a question about disabled access requirements. So if your building does not have a commercial space on the ground floor, meaning that your building is purely residential units, then you are not subject to making any disabled access upgrades. However, if you have a ground floor commercial space, you do have to follow federal law because we cannot decouple that. So those would be required to follow the requirements of Chapter 11B in the California Building Code. Um, we know that these are old spaces, and so sometimes um, we need to be very flexible in how we do this, but the idea is that we have to uh, try to our best to achieve code compliance through that. Um, that said, uh, in talking to property owners, that's why we gave those buildings the maximum amount of time to comply with the ordinance. So you have the full seven years to get the work done because we know it's a, it's a different factor in doing this and it's going to take some, uh, some architecture and making sure that those compliance uh, standards are met. Good morning. Good morning. I had a question. Uh, it seemed like a couple of people have already mentioned the concern about contractors coming in and giving you bids for the work. Uh, I had another question that kind of tied into that. Why was there never any guidelines given as to the scope of the retrofit program. I know you guys said it's a, a, a partial retrofit program. Why was there not given a, why were we not given a scope of the work that possibly could, might need to be done so that we don't have contractors possibly going outside of the scope and doing more work than we really need? Uh, these guides, guidelines actually exist. Uh, Chapter 34B of the San Francisco Building Code is the, the, the meat of the ordinance, where it actually goes through and explains which of the structural standards you can use and to what uh, level you're looking for in, in a performance uh, using those standards. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. I have two questions. Uh, one is, do you have a concern about Victorian buildings that have bay windows or large bays that extend up the full four stories with multiple bays side by side. It's not really addressed in your remarks or in the documentation, but it strikes me both as a contractor and a building owner that these facades are extremely weak. The second question I have concerns four-story buildings on fill with a garage and bay, 
bay windows in the style that I just described to you before. Are these kind of buildings a concern for you as well? Uh, yes, they're a concern, but not necessarily more than others. Those issues about the nature of the, the soil and uh, the configuration of the windows, those will come up during the course of the, the uh, uh, not so much the screening, but during the course of the engineering of the retrofit. So the technical criteria that are listed in Chapter 34B have guidelines, regulations for how to account for bay windows. Uh, generally, you discount them. They're not walls. So if they're not in line with the rest of the wall line, you mm -hmm. can't count them. But now we're getting into a little bit of the engineering. Mm -hmm. On the, the soil issue, again, when you get into the technical criteria with your engineer, those issues are addressed through the technical criteria in Chapter 34B. If you have weaker or softer soil, uh, that will change the nature of the design, and you may require more structure as part of your retrofit. Uh, you didn't ask about liquefaction, but is that? I didn't, but that's an interesting question. Uh, with respect to the latter uh, example, though, it's a four-unit building. So in effect, it's not even a target. Oh, four, I thought you said four-story. You meant four-unit. Four-unit, four unit, three-story. Four-unit, you're exempt, right. period. But should I just forget that? No. So this is the interesting <laughs> challenge. When you talk with an engineer, you're going to have a conversation about the performance of your building. But you may not, you, for purposes of complying with this program, you're exempt. You don't have to do it. So this program, there's a lot of buildings in San Francisco. When you talk to engineers, you will find that they are not expected to perform very well in earthquakes. Victorians, you did mention those, very typically three units, maybe two units, narrow, mid-block buildings. Most of those are going to be exempt from the program because they just don't have five units. So they're exempt. It doesn't mean they're good buildings. It means they're not the buildings that are being targeted with this program. And to add a little bit about that, since David brought up liquefaction, um, some of you may be aware of what that means, but the idea of having some uh, weak or susceptible, being susceptible to weak soil beneath your property, um, that was another factor in deciding to put those buildings that are in mapped liquefaction areas in tier four. So again, giving you the most, uh, most amount of time to comply. Now, the ordinance doesn't require that you address those soil conditions. That's important to point out. However, if the owner wishes to do that, we want to reward them by giving them a little more time to comply. Um, now, what we've done is we've worked with Code for America to create an application on our website Site. So if you're curious, if your, uh, if your building falls in the state adopted map for areas susceptible to liquefaction, uh, please visit our website and uh, you can click on that, on that application and enter your block and lot number. Um, I, just a word of caution, please enter your block and lot number as it appears on your notice. So if you have a few zeros in front of your lot number, make sure you include those or the app will not work properly. But that will give you a simple yes or no if you're in that uh, area susceptible to liquefaction. The only time you have to think about liquefaction during the screening phase, which is the first year, is when you're assigning the building to a compliance tier. It doesn't affect your eligibility for the program. It doesn't affect whether you're exempt from the program. It's just after you've done, you've decided, you've filled out the, the, uh, the screening form and you're in the program, now you have to be assigned to a tier. That's the only time you look for liquefaction. And at that point, you've already got an engineer or architect involved, so they can go to the website or they can look up the map. Okay, um, my name is Charles. Uh, so most of the uh, soft story, they're probably 100 years old or even older. So um, I'm, I'm wondering during construction, uh, when they have a city inspection, things being exposed, uh, electrical wires, pumping, gas, gas pipeline, if they are not up to code, will be also mandatory uh, upgrade. The intent of this ordinance isn't to, to trigger upgrades like that. However, there are certain life safety upgrades that you can't ignore. Code won't allow you to do that. But we put very specific language uh, in the ordinance intentionally to say that the work shown on your permitted set of plans should be only limited to that soft story. So that way, it streamlines the permit process. As Robert mentioned, you, if, if you're, everything's lined up, you should be able to get a permit in one day, which is exactly why we don't want a, you know, additional garages added or whatever you could think of that might trigger some other code upgrades um, to leave it really uh, limited to the scope of the ordinance and as long as something isn't dangerous and an imminent hazard you should be able to proceed uh, without triggering additional upgrade requirements on other services if you have an existing non-conforming condition you should be able to keep it unless unless something is triggering it if your electrical is outdated is dangerous I think I 
highly recommend you to you know upgrade it when you are opening. You know. <coughs> I think it's very common it's for a hundred years old uh, building. Well, but there's there's a big gap between non-conforming and dangerous. Okay, so I'm I'm I agree with both. <laughs> if it's non-conforming, you're going to be allowed to keep it until it reaches the level of being dangerous. In which case. It does, this program doesn't even matter. If you've got a dangerous condition, you should be addressing that right now anyway. Okay. All right, thank you. Lots of the buildings are 100 years old. Many of them are only 50 years old. Many of them, lots of them are from the 1920s. So. For example, your stairs may not meet the rise and run, but you can keep it, but it could be a dangerous condition still. Right. So you might want to do something anyway. Okay. Albert Arutia, Santos Arutia Structural Engineers. Um, my question's about... Uh, planning, if you have a historic resource or a uh, commercial space and it affects the, the look of the building, will you get over the counter planning or will it sit back in planning for six months or whatever? Excellent question. And, uh, and we've, worked, we've worked very hard with the planning department to streamline this process because of exactly that reason. Um, so what we've been encouraging people to do is to not do any exterior work to your building, and DBI has also agreed that if, the, if you're not touching the exterior of the building and changing the look of it and the work is really limited to the interior as it should be, um, you won't have a problem with, with city planning. In the event that you are changing, say, a storefront door or something like that, um, they, it depends on what level of resource you're at, um, but working with the historic preservation staff at the planning department, um, a potential resource is different than an identified resource, as I know you know, um, but making sure that a potential resource uh, is, is looked at, but really it's the identified resources, the land landmark buildings, if you're doing exterior work on those buildings, um, that's when you have to really go talk to planning and, and work with them. Now, they have agreed to try to give some priority to this because they know it's a mandatory program and owners are under hard timelines. Um, so we, they're conscious of that and they've agreed to work with the uh, owners, architects, and engineers to help streamline that process. Okay. All right. Because ADA part would be uh, for commercial spaces. So you're going to have to work with doorways and entranceways and that sort of thing. Exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. John Lurie uh, Albert. For ADA, I assume you are under the threshold 130,000, you can use the 20% rule as a hardship. Good morning, I'm an owner of a tier three building and one of the decisions, and I'm convinced that it is uh, subject to the uh, retrofit, is when to do it. And I have two concerns. Um, first of all, are the design criteria totally solid now? So if I retain you know, a structural engineer and a contractor to do the work, let's say within the next year, I don't have to worry about things changing. And the second thing is, I've read about potential f financing available. Uh, I went to that workshop and quite frankly, no one had anything new. They talked about refinancing your property or, or um, you know, second loans and so forth. No special rates or anything like that. I did not see the green River or whatever is the mm -hmm. green people there. So those are the two concerns I have, whether you know whether or not to go now or you know wait and, you know three or four years. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll address both of your questions there. The first one regarding the structural standards. So um, the, the ordinance standards are set in stone. Yes, they're correct now. Um, and so, so what we had happen over the summer, which was a great thing, and, and the Structural Engineers Association of California deserves a lot of credit. They performed a benchmarking study. Um, the ordinance has several different structural standards you can use to achieve the level of retrofit that we're looking for here. And they looked at all those different standards. Previously, that hadn't been done. And they really benchmarked them to understand that if we do a level of retrofit using one standard or the other, that you're meeting the same criteria. So that said, I would encourage you to look at the, the standards in the ordinance, but make sure you're looking at the most current version too, and the Department of Building Inspection will be able to provide that to you. Um, on the second question about financing, so um, this was something that was very important to Mayor Lee. He was not comfortable putting forth this, this ordinance unless we had comprehensive financing options. So that was one of the first things that we looked at. So over a year ago, um, we started knocking on the doors of local banks, and they answered the mayor's call in force. Um, we had our first financial summit with the mayor in January of last year, or January of this year, excuse me, and and uh, these banks have agreed to do, like you said, what they already do. So, um, you know, we're, we're, we're in a situation here, of, and that's not a bad thing. We're in a situation here where um, we experience high property values and low interest rates due to the, to the economic status right now. And the banks have, have said, yeah, we can refi these buildings, give you some extra money, um, do construction loans. We can do, if you own multiple buildings, maybe do something based off a portfolio. But the idea of providing options was, was really the strong point there because we've seen in previous retrofit programs 
experience that a one-size-fits-all approach does not work to financing. Um, it was also important to the mayor that we developed a, a program on our own side. So uh, some of you may be familiar with the Green Finance SF program that I mentioned earlier. Uh, if you'd like to learn more, please sign up on the sheet back there. But this is a different this is a different way to finance the project. This would allow you to actually have the loan issued to the property as opposed to the individual. So if you were to sell that property, the loan would be assumed by the new owner. And instead of making normal loan payments like you would on any other kind of standard loan, um, this is paid back through your property taxes and amortized over 20 years and a low rate. So this is a fantastic option. And the more people we have interested in this, the better rate we're going to get. So that's, uh, again, why I'm encouraging people, if they're interested, please sign up before you leave. If for some reason you don't see the, the sign-in sheet, um, please go to our website, email me. We want to make sure that we include you in these notifications if we are able to uh, develop the program to the extent that we'd like to with this effort. Thank you. I can add a note about the question about the technical criteria being solid. They're solid in the same way that the building code is solid. The building code changes every three years. So there's that to keep in mind. But the main point I want to say is that this is a brand new program addressing 3,000 buildings, creating a new market. There's going to be innovation. <coughs> there's going to be cost savings. There's going to be people who figure out how to do this better two years from now than know how to do it now. I'm not saying you should wait. Uh, uh, but I'm, I'm saying that we saw that with the unreinforced masonry program as well. Innovations will develop. I don't think the engineering criteria are going to get any tougher. They could get a slightly more lenient as people begin to apply these criteria and the engineers get a sense of, well, that's an unintended consequence. We actually meant something else, and that, that very much could happen. But we have gone through the study. We have vetted those. The, the Chapter 34B refers to <coughs> national standards and to special documents that were prepared for programs just like this. So they've been vetted as much as any building code uh, provision has been vetted. But AB 107 still hasn't been published. AB 107 is the administrative bulletin being put together by uh, DBI with consultants to uh, implement the details of the program. The reason we're putting together AB 107 is that the ordinance itself, Chapter 34B, is, very, is rather slim. It tells the engineer what standard to go use. But in any application like that, you know, the building department has about 100 different administrative bulletins that cover different things. So there will be an administrative bulletin as well to say how to implement the various standards that are listed in Chapter 34B within the context of this program. It also provides an a place where we can put interpretations and where the building code can uh, make a clear understanding of what this particular provision means. It's essentially done. It's going to the Code Advisory Committee in two weeks, one week, and it, you know, it was done a month ago, so that's, uh, we expect that uh, to be uh, ready as soon as we can. Uh, yeah, the um, new code goes into effect January 1st. Are there any changes in the structural requirements? Uh, there will be a new building code uh, in California and in San Francisco starting on January 1st. It will not change the criteria. The only thing that might change is, is that the administrative bulletin might have to be rewritten to change the section numbers or to coordinate with other things that are changing from the current building code to the new one. The technical criteria will stay the same. Okay. Um, are you going to continue to waive the permit fee for these uh, upgrades? Only AB 94, Correct. That's, that's the only time we waive the fees. You have to pay a permit fees for these retrofit. We, we only waived it under AB 94, and that program has stopped already. So, so AB 94, for, for those of you who don't know, was a, uh, was a, a directive that was signed by the mayor um, f several years ago at a voluntary program. Uh, what this voluntary program gave you was expedited permitting and a uh, partial discount on the permit fees. Um, as Robert said, for the, the group of buildings that are subject to this ordinance, that program has ended for the five or more units. That said, for any buildings that are four units or less, um, as David mentioned, you know, these are not buildings that are subject to this program, but they're, if you talk to an engineer, they're equally just as dangerous does not mean you uh, can't use those provisions as well. So if you do have a, a four-unit building or a, a smaller building that has a soft story condition and you're retrofitting it um, you know, per AB 94 standards, you would be subject to the expedited permitting and also a reduced permit fee as well. Um, however, we've, we've seen this program in effect for several years and very few owners took advantage of it. So um, if there are owners out there, we'd love to get you in that program, but um, there's, been, there's unfortunately been little demand for it. I see. So AB 94 will... Will, will stay in, in effect with the fee waiver, but it won't apply to this program. Yeah, It'll only, stay in effect for if you have less than five units. Correct. If you have five units, you're in the mandatory program, and you will have to pay a permit fee. Correct. 
Okay. Thank you. Hi, my name's Steve. My question will follow on the innovation question, uh, statement and the um, and the uh, concurrent program statement. Has any have any steps been taken to increase the labor pool of available construction workers for this knuckle busting work to do the retrofits in the sense of city college outreach or other colleges? It's been my observation in San Francisco that the workers come from often from outside. Almost, uh, I would say, more than half the time, as far as the Central Valley and that there's a limitation for whatever reason in the city itself, and, and that there's an opportunity even into the high schools, perhaps, to increase the labor pool because this is a, it's a good sized program. Mm -hmm. um, great question. I, I, I have to say I slightly disagree. I don't think there's an inequity of available contractors to do this work. Uh, we've been doing this outreach for, for quite some time and we've heard overwhelmingly that there are people looking for this work. But that said, it, it gives us an opportunity to engage. Uh, I like how you mentioned uh, people in high school and city college coming out of that. Um, we're doing some work in the Bayview District right now uh, with uh, um, looking at some resiliency issues out there and getting uh, high school kids involved in uh, simple tasks that that doesn't require specialized knowledge, that if you could be trained in a few weeks to start doing this under someone who really knows what they're doing, sure. they'd be able to start working on that. So there are programs uh, in development right now to try to do that outreach. I'll, I'll just encourage you. That's good news. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I had a question about, um, I heard like in Berkeley that there's like a program that uh, they can get help, like um, a grant or something that provides 10% to 15% of the earthquake retrofit. I'm wondering if it, uh, San Francisco will have something like that. David, are you aware of that? Uh, it sounds to me like you're referring to the rebate of the transfer tax in Berkeley. I'm not sure. Okay. In, in Berkeley does have a program for the re partial rebate on the transfer tax for a house okay. if you do a cripple wall retrofit. So it's a different kind of structure, a different kind of program, and it's a voluntary thing. So the current program does not have a rebate like that. Berkeley also had a soft story program, but it was evaluation only. And as far as I know, there was no, there was no rebate. So I think you're talking about the transfer tax, which does not really apply here. Okay. And Thank if you. we are talking about transfer tax, um, just to bring it up so everyone's aware, uh, several years ago we did put this to a vote in San Francisco. It was called Proposition N, and they created a seismic solar transfer tax rebate. Um, unfortunately, most of you already own your buildings. You're not in the, in the, in the process of purchasing them. But uh, for those of those who are purchasing, uh, do have uh, an option to get one-third of the transfer tax rebated to them after sale, uh, provided that they're doing either solar or seismic work. Again, not related to the, the ordinance specifically, so this could be any type of structure or any type of occupancy, but if you are doing that work, Work, the city does have a, a program to help you out with some funding assistance. Okay, thank you. Uh, I wanna, I've been running across um, several buildings up in Diamond Heights, Twin Peaks, where um, if you can imagine street level garage behind the garage, apartment buildings, second story, uh, sorry, units in the apartment, and then below the, the units in the back of the garage is crawl space. So you basically have two stories and crawl space. I, I think that's considered part of this program. I'm not sure. Do you understand? I say yes. Yes. Because two, it's three stories. Two, two stories. And in fact, the, the language of the ordinance is written very plainly to not use the word, not just use the word story, because story comes with a very complicated definition in the building code. So it says two stories above grade plus a crawl space or three stories above grade. So if you have a crawl space and two stories above it, that's potentially in the program, as long as you also have five units pre-1978 wood frame. And then the target story would be not just the garage, it would be the garage level, but you would need to upgrade those units behind the garage. Is that correct? Uh, because well, the target story is that story and the story below. Yeah, we don't, crawl we don't space upgrade below. individual units, you upgrade stories, but the target oh, yeah. story idea is really only at the screening level it may come up again during when you do the retrofit, but the, for, for screening purposes, the building you described sounds like it would have two target stories. The underfloor space, by definition, is a target story, and the garage story, which is different from the stories above, right. will also be a target story. So you've got two target stories. If either one of those is wood frame and its lateral system, you're in the program. Okay. And then... With and when it comes to I want to ask you a design question. When it comes can, to do the retrofit, you yeah. probably have to address both of those stories. And the units in the back, can I use gypboard as a sheer element? There are there are again there are the ordinance the chapter thirty four B offers you different 
engineering criteria, some are harder, some are easier, some are more comprehensive, some are more uh, direct. Some of them allow you to use Jipboard, yes. Okay. It allows Thanks. you to take advantage of Jipboard, yes. All right. Thank you. Yes, hello. I, I have two questions. One is that uh, I know this program is supposed to minimize disruption to your tenants, even your commercial tenants, but suppose uh, you're uh, doing some sites at Richardford for a restaurant and the restaurant owner operator says that, well, you're really interfering with my business here. We're losing business and so forth like that. Uh, what requirements, city requirements are there uh, that we compensate the the commercial tenant for loss of business, for example. And then my second question has to do with uh, a follow-up on your comment about the uh, unintended consequences if there were some that were identified that you might pull back on the ordinance. What about if new research or information comes forward that says that your requirements for seismic retrofit is too stringent, would you be willing to pull that back? You want to take the engineering question? Then? Sure. So the engineering que question is, yes, when there's new research, the engineering community and the building code community always responds to new research. It might not be fast enough to, uh, to affect the timelines, especially in the early tiers of this one, but there is always research going on. It's always incorporated into the code in a kind of careful, methodical process. Yeah. Having said that, in addition to the criteria that are specifically listed in Chapter 34B, there's always one, and there is in Chapter 34B, that says, any other rational method that your engineer and the building official together can work out and say, this is trying to achieve about the same thing, and that's open to negotiation as well. So if we find uh, innovative systems or research, it's possible that that can affect the engineering, thank, thank as you. it always is. Uh, to address your question about business interruption, um, this is a very important question because in this subset of buildings we know there's about 2,000 small businesses that employ about 7,000 local residents. Mm -hmm. um, we've also seen historically from other natural disasters that these are the types of businesses that are most vulnerable in a disaster. So these are types of businesses where if there was significant damage after an earthquake, chances are they're not going to open up again. And it displaces local business and that's something that the city has tried uh, adamantly to, to try to preserve. Um, again, the retrofit was designed so you wouldn't be shutting down these businesses. Uh, typically, obviously you have to talk to an engineer about the details in your specific building, but typically we try to limit these elements along the perimeter walls or along areas so that you're not closing down entire businesses. So would they have to safeguard for construction and be flexible with their hours? Yes, but the benefit is, is overwhelming to them when you think about what could happen in a potential disaster. Mm. Well, but that doesn't answer my question. Does the city have requirements to address this issue if the commercial owner operator says that uh, I'm losing business because of what you're doing. I mean, we may all think that this is not really uh, much of an interference with the business, but they may claim that uh, they're, uh, it's interfering in some significant way with the way they do business. Mm -hmm. um, I'm certainly not an expert in the matter, but I don't believe the rent board addresses commercial rents, correct? Yeah. So, so I would say it would be uh, dependent upon your lease agreement with that tenant um, and what the provisions are for construction and looking at um, not only just general construction, but required construction. There's probably further safeguards to say when a city mandates you, it, it gives you some protection. But again, I would, I would definitely recommend talking to your real estate professional and or mm -hmm. an att attorney in that matter. Okay. Thank you. Just as a reminder, if you have a ground floor business or mercantile occupancy, those were intentionally put into tier four to give you more time mm -hmm. to help address some of those coordination issues. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi. My name is Terrence Jones. Uh, this is kind of an unintended consequences uh, question. Um, kind of a glass is half full. I'm, I'm sure with, with all legislation, there are unintended consequences that are positive. Um, there may be some permit expediting that, that kind of comes along as a free ride in this program. Have you kind of compiled lists of the positive things that happen to landlords? I mean, this is going to, it's going to cost money and everyone knows that and it's going to make the building better. But are there other things like, well, that permit I've been holding off on doing this other thing, I can slide it in through this program. Uh, well, I, I mean, we're all, we're all here to provide housing, but also to make money for our families. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like that would be a nice thing to have unintended pos positive comp um, impacts of this. And it's, it's an excellent point. Um, you know, this is probably the single largest investment that you all own. 
uh, we want to be sensitive to that fact, and this is this is how you've chosen to to invest your money, uh, you know, to protect your families. And doing that, um, you have to be sensitive to the fact that the extensive studies have been done that every dollar you spend in hazard mitigation would save you four dollars in the event of a disaster. So if we talk about spending your money wisely, this is I mean this is a benefit in and of itself. Yes, there are other unintended consequences that come along with it, um, but I think the the sheer fact of well, I guess. When the uh, brick UMB retrofit mm -hmm. process came along, people figured it out, just like you were talking about, you know, maybe you should wait 12 months to get your engineering bid because maybe there'll be a cheaper way to do it. It'll become more efficient. That's what I'm talking mm -hmm. about, unintended consequences. It came out of the UMB program. Mm -hmm. um, were there things that owners found, hey, this is a nice byproduct. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the, the UMB program, it's a perfect example. Um, I, I worked in private industry at the time helping people deal with that, that ordinance. And uh, obviously the requirements of that ordinance are, are were much more substantial than the requirements of this ordinance. So you saw a whole market developed around it. Um, you knew that the building was basically getting a full seismic retrofit anyway. So things that the code had previously triggered seismic retrofits on, like a change of use um, or, or a, a giant raise in the occupant load, uh, several other factors that, that would usually trigger that all of a sudden people knew they had to do this anyway. So it created an interesting marketplace, which I'm sure you all saw for the last uh, 15 years with the brick buildings. Um, will that happen here? Probably not to that degree, mainly because we're not talking about the work being as significant as, say, the UMB ordinance. Um, but I definitely think you will start to see that. Um, you know, the planning department's already been talking about encouraging people to, you know, convert ground floor space. But again, uh, you know, converting that to a previously unused space, maybe to a retail space or a neighborhood serving business. But again, that would be something that would happen outside of the permit process for the retrofit. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lisa Gelfand. I'm an architect. And I have been listening to owners say, I'm going to fix my building with, um, with a lot of worry. What is my liability as an architect doing a partial retrofit of a building that I know will, will suffer significant damage um, in, when the earthquake, earthquake comes, even after we do this uh, soft story work? Well, this is a big question that uh, engineers and architects always have to deal with as we get into uh, innovative practice, particularly dealing with existing buildings. Usually the easy protection for the professional is to say, I met the code. And you probably have the same pr protection here that uh, you complied with the ordinance, and if that's what your client asked you to do, you've done that. Now, I'm not an attorney, but the, that's usually that has been the, the way of thinking about it. Now, I, I, you already said you're an architect, so I don't know if AIA is planning anything, but the Structural Engineers Association of Northern California is also thinking about this question, and I hope we'll be developing kind of a set of FAQs, something to help the engineering community understand how to communicate some of these ideas to their clients and what it means to have engineered a retrofit that doesn't meet some higher standard than somebody else. So these are big questions, they're important. I think complying with the ordinance, I'm not afraid of it. I don't think it imposes any liability on me to do what the ordinance says is being done, as long as I am very clear with my client about what it is I'm doing. Hi there, thank you so much. Harlan Hoffman, architect. I've got a, several questions. Uh, first question is I came at 11.30, I thought I was gonna start at 11.30, can't start a little early, but um, is there a list of uh, contact people for architects, design professionals, so that uh, we know how to get some of these answers as we're working on these projects? So Harlan, I'm sorry, you were half an hour late, so I'm not going to answer that question for you. <laughs> Um, I didn't know. Uh, we, we did tackle this a little bit, but um, the, the best thing that I've been telling everybody in the room is that um, these postcards here have both the DBI website and uh, the um, Earthquake Safety Implementations website. Please sign up on that, um, especially on their Earthquake Safety Implementation website. That'll have our mailing list, and we will notify everyone of the events that are happening, and we do intend to do uh, some kind of a big, maybe an all-day summit. Seems like we have enough interest in doing this, where we could have, uh, our, again, our, our partners in private finance that have been there, our partners in public finance that are working with the city, engineers, contractors, architects, and everybody else that touches uh, this world uh, involved with the ordinance uh, that we can just walk through and ask the questions that they need and get, connect people with quality um, professionals that can do this work. And the people on the list will be notified of these uh, the, Correct. The meetings? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, second question, yeah, that, actually, that was my second question. Um, the third question is, someone touched on the, the scale of value question, which is always prominent to me as an architect, where you're doing some type of work, it means you may as well do the other type of work as well or something. So there's going to be those things that 
I'm sure are going to be controversial for people as well. Like, why, why am I doing fixing these stairs when all I got to do is fix the building from rocking back and forth in an earthquake? Those kind of things. But I'm assuming that there would be scale of value in terms of someone asked a question about uh, cost of permits. So if you're going to get a permit for complying to this program, would you then, and you said, okay, well, I'm doing such and such work, so I'm going to fix those stairs, or I'm going to uh, fix the lighting or something like that because it's funky or whatever, things like that. Would they be able to apply under the same permit, or they have to be separate permits? So they do get the value of that scale of, mm -hmm. of, of, of value. The, the, legally, they can't be prevented from doing the work at the same time. However, the ordinance requires that the work would be separated when it comes to the phase of the permit. Um, again, because we don't want to muddy up the streamlining of the permit to do the retrofit. Um, because if we start adding stuff onto that, all of a sudden it makes DBI's job at the counter more difficult. They have more things they have to plan check. And that's why the intent is to really limit it to the retrofit for that permit. And that's a permit that will ultimately get inspected and you'll, issue, uh, you'll be issued a certificate of final completion from the building inspector. So that's a permit that should kind of sit by itself. Um, Anything else that you'd want to do, you'd have to apply for a separate permit for that work. Sometimes it seems like it would be hard to distinguish at, some, at, at certain times which is and which isn't. So there's mm -hmm. probably some gray areas there, I'd imagine, as well. Yeah, there's like a bit of it, but that's, um, that's why we have uh, excellent plan check staff that will be looking at this uh, at the counter for you. I support this program, and I'm really glad the city is organizing it. My question is around earthquake insurance for the type of buildings. Is the city doing anything to help bring affordable insurance? Absolutely. Um, I don't know how many of you have tackled that, that uh, issue of earthquake insurance. Most owners do not carry earthquake insurance. I don't think that's news to anybody in this room. Um, typically, uh, it's been cost prohibitive. People have said, uh, you know, I'd rather put the money into a retrofit than paying the premium for, for uh, earthquake insurance. But that said, uh, California Earthquake Authority, who we work very closely with, is, is very tuned into this. And they're launching several retrofit programs, mainly to address it on a voluntary issue. So not necessarily outside, it's necessarily outside of this program, but, um, you know, working on single family home retrofits and other things where the city, uh, you know, doesn't intend to put any mandatory measures for single-family homes to do seismic retrofits, but we want to provide as many incentives to make this voluntary work happen as we can. And the CEA has a long-term goal of looking at this, that if we keep upgrading properties bit by bit, eventually the risk is reduced um, in a very big way. And so if they do that, hopefully it leads to actually cheaper insurance prices for earthquake insurance. So it's, a, it's not a quick fix. It's a long-time, uh, long, long mitigation strategy that they have, but uh, in my opinion, a very successful one uh, because of the amount of money they're willing to rebate to customers. You heard me mention the, the prop end transfer tax earlier, but the uh, the type of rebates they're talking about giving to the single family homeowners uh, are $3,000 for the ones that meet a specific program that they're launching right now. And that's enough money to get someone off the couch and, and start to look at these things more seriously. So uh, we will continue to work with them and as opportunities come up, obviously make those available to the public. My name is David Yadigar, engineer. Been to a couple buildings out there already. This is mainly for you two actually that have complete brick foundations and are sitting on bedrock and when I explained to owners that oh it's not just a retrofit you're going to need to redo the foundation and a twenty thirty forty thousand dollar job is all of a sudden a two hundred thousand dollar job they're a lot more reluctant to do the work and um, comply with the current code and such um, I've explored the idea of doing just new foundations at the front and the back of the buildings you know, which leaving brick on the sides, it's like th their, their take is this building's been here for 100 years, it's sitting on bedrock, and I'm not concerned about it. Um, and I want to be, as an engineer that they're hiring, I want to say, hey, this is, um, this is an unsafe seismic condition, but ultimately how far are you guys going to go when I come to the city with plans? Um, in requiring brick foundations to be completely upgraded for this program. There, there's, there's nothing right now absolutely requiring you to replace a brick foundation. However, in most cases, as an engineer, you'll understand, when you do the calculations, you will find that the existing brick foundation is not adequate to what we, as we call it, develop the strength of the new wall that you're putting in. So very often that brick foundation will have to be either reinforced or replaced. We know that. Most of these buildings do not have brick foundations, only the older ones, usually the Victorians. The Victorians usually are fewer than five units, so they're not in the program. But yes, there will definitely be some buildings in this program that have brick, brick footings that will not work by calculation. Now, some of the criteria in Chapter 34B allow the engineer to make as much use of that existing non-conforming material as they can. 
So if we can do testing and we can demonstrate that the brick has some strength, we can take advantage of it. So it's not a, an automatic bricks no good, therefore must replace them. You do have to do the engineering on it, and if the, if the brick is not adequate to do what you, the design wants it to do, then you have to, do, you have to put in some other kind of footing. That's true. But it, it's not automatic. You can get through the criteria that are in Chapter 34B all the capacity out of that existing brick as is there. You can take advantage of it. That's about the farthest backward that the engineering community can bend on that. Okay. And then as far as um, capping and encapsulating brick foundations instead of just completely replacing them, I'm assuming that's what you're talking about when you say reinforcing it? Well, you have to do the engineering. Yes. Uh, I probably this is not the right forum to discuss the merits of capping brick footings, but uh, if, you, if you do the engineering, you can take advantage of the strength that is there. Okay. Thank you. Hi, Sherry Nicewander. We're a contractor, done a lot of work in the city. Um, I've listened to the comments about the benefits of waiting to do this work um, so that more innovative programs are available or, or techniques or um, some wonderful thing that some engineer or somebody thinks up that makes it less expensive probably and less intrusive. There's another side to that though, and that is we're trying to estimate how many of these buildings are gonna stay in the program. But if everybody waits until the deadline, there are a lot of contractors, but there's not that many contractors. And uh, what will happen in those cases will be that the supply and demand will force prices up. So my suggestion is that everybody look at their own situation and what they feel comfortable with. Another downside of waiting is there's no guarantee these men have given us that there is not going to be an earthquake before this schedule is done. Um, so if you feel you want to go forward, I would not fear that there is going to be some fantastic product come out that would have saved you thousands of dollars. Do it when you feel comfortable doing it. Get your team together. You need to interview several people until you meet those people that are going to be in your face for three months every single day and talking to your tenants. <laughs> um, we're doing one right now and it's working out great, but it is a stressful situation. So having to compete with all those other 4,000 property owners would be a little bit difficult. Thanks. Hi, my name is Bruce. Is there a software program out there where the owner could actually plug in some information about the building and then shake it? and then see what can happen. And then there's suggested uh, solutions and then shake it again. And, and then we got, we got some idea of what to expect from these architects. Uh, well, if there were, I wouldn't have a job. <laughs> but no, seriously, that's, I mean, that en engineering software is not quite that simple. A lot of people are looking for things like that. There are a few online kind of, quick checklists and things, but they're not really going to give you a sense of performance. And honestly, it would be very difficult for anyone to stick their neck out and say after answering four questions that you are going to be safe in a certain earthquake. Nobody would take that responsibility, given the fact that there's a whole industry of engineering existing to answer that question in more sophisticated terms. So, uh, I mean, engineers can lose their licenses for, for giving quick answers to short questions. So. The, the sad answer, I'm afraid, is there is not something that, that simple. What there is, yes. is a screening form, because that really, the, the screening form was invented to try to find the buildings that we know need more study. So if you're in the program because of the screening form, that should tell you something right away. Okay, thank you. And then also, is there a component of uh, fire suppression in this where, um, there were no sprinklers and you may want to put some in and there's a coverage of the tenant pass through with that because but that's what wanna, after 1906 if you uh, want to put in sprinklers you're, city you're certainly down. welcome to but the retrofit wouldn't force you to put in new sprinklers but you you're, you're welcome to do it in addition to it under a separate permit perhaps but we wouldn't force you to put in sprinklers because I think with 1906 the earthquake itself less people died from that and it was the fires afterwards that actually killed more people and destroyed more buildings. Yeah. Again, we wouldn't force you to put in sprinklers f under this program, but if you want to, you can do it under a separate permit. All right. Thank you. Hi. My name is uh, Raphael. Uh, I wanted to uh, bring up this issue of uh, 
financing and 100% pass through to tenants on, on this program. And I just wanted to know what sort of guarantee um, does the city have in, in guaranteeing that this is actually 100% pass through with the allowance for hardship you know, from tenants or landlords. Because ultimately, I feel that the loan is being taken out by the landlord, and the landlord is obligated to you know, pay back the loan within, say, 20 years, which is you know, the time frame that you were looking at. So what if, along the way, if 50% of the tenants decide that they're going to file hardship, you know, who is going to be responsible to pay back the loan? Uh, what sort of guarantee or protection would landlords have in, in, in this program from the city? If your tenants qualify for exemption from the pass-through due to financial hardship, um, the cost is borne by the landlord, not the city. Can we check with them in advance to see if they're going to object? <laughs> oh, is it part of the code? Where the ordinance I'd, I'd like to ask everyone if you have questions, please come up to the microphone because we're trying to capture the audio so, so we can reality, stream this, otherwise it won't pick up. It's not 100% pass through. If you know, something should happen along the way, then it is not 100% pass through. What do you mean if something should happen along I the mean, way? If, if, let's say if your building has eight tenants or 10 tenants, and then if along the way, let's say in five years time, you know, five tenants for whatever reason, five for hardship, then you're looking at only 50% contribution from the tenants. That is true, and you raised a good point. Um, the way that the new hardship provisions were written, a tenant can file for hardship exemption at any time after you give them the notice of pass-through, whether it be in the first year, the fifth year, the 15th year. If they have a change in circumstances that creates a financial hardship, they can apply to the rent board for exemption of um, the pass-through for a limited time or an unlimited time. I also think it's important to point out that um, this ordinance did not change these requirements. Uh, the rent ordinance was not altered. It, uh, existing, uh, there was language in there that said seismic work required by law is eligible for a 100% pass through to the tenants. Um, in working with the San Francisco Apartment Association and other ownership groups in the city, um, that was something that they were happy with and satisfied with. Uh, as you know, there was, there was significant efforts to try to change that requirement. And so um, the property owner community that we've been addressing is, has, been, uh, has been expressed their gratitude that, that that has remained in place because that was part of the original agreement for their support. Um, so we are working to make sure that if San Franciscans, uh, I know you all are in situ situations where you do have to manage that relationship with your tenants, but if there is a, a situation where a tenant due to dis disability or for other circumstances truly can't afford that, um, you know, th there are hardship provisions for that reason. That's why we want to protect, you know, some of our most vulnerable populations that live in these buildings. Um, there's also another thing I'd like to point out. You heard me mention earlier that after the retrofit is done, you'll be issued a certificate of final compliance. Completion. Um, that's required by the building code anytime a, a seismic retrofit's done, and uh, I want to make it very clear that that's an amended certificate of final completion. A lot of you who are looking at, at rent law um, issues uh, know that if you were if you were uh, received a certificate of final completion prior to 1979, you're not subject to rent control. Well, that certificate of completion has to be for new construction or for the actual residential use. So I just wanted to make sure that was very clear to everybody. And I'd also just like to clarify, we've had um, hardship provisions in the rent ordinance for years. So very few tenants do take advantage of that. Although I think um, you might expect a few more tenants will be doing it because the rent board now is required to notify tenants at the time you file your petition that they have the right to um, request relief from the pass-through based on financial hardship if they meet the specific criteria in the ordinance. Sorry, I, I was the one who shouted out the question earlier. Um, <laughs> along those lines, there's, there's some new legislation about smoking, and there's some kind of the preemptive way to address the smoking is to send out a letter to your tenants saying, do you smoke? And if so, we'll, we'll put you on the list of units that smoke. Could we, along the lines of this discussion, send out a preemptive letter to the tenant saying, we're going to do this retrofit. It's a good thing. Um, we're just taking a non-binding poll, will you object to it based on financial hardship, or are you willing to cover part of it? 
Has anyone addressed that or thought about that? Absolutely. And, the, and again, the ordinance doesn't require that kind of conversation to happen, but I think that's a good move. It doesn't move. prevent it? It doesn't prevent it. No, I think that's a good move. I mean, unless I'm, correct me if I'm wrong here, Sandy, but I think having that, having that open Maybe dialogue. Sandy, as an administrative law judge, would be the better person to answer. <laughs> go ahead, Sandy. <laughs> go ahead and answer. Um, I think Patrick's correct. The law doesn't require it or prevent it, but you don't want to cross the line into harassment of your tenants. That, that's what I'd be concerned about. And it would, of course, be non-binding. Even if they said, now, I'm not going to do that. Right, right, sure. Yeah. And, and in any event, if you have to do the work, you have to do the work. Sure. So. Good morning. My name is Aurora Mendoza McKnight, and I'm a real estate, commercial real estate uh, broker. And I have a couple of things I'd just like to um, ask um, if... A landlord is selling his property. Is it mandatory that he retrofit before uh, he uh, completes the transaction? Um, excellent. I'm sorry. Is that the question? Um, yes. So, so uh, no, it is not required to happen at the time of sale. It has to comply with the time limits that were explained in the table earlier. So there is a disclosure requirement. Many of you are familiar with what they call a 3R report that the building department issues anytime there's a time of sale. So there's been uh, part of the ordinance amends the 3R report requirements. So it would identify if your building is in a program. So obviously it would have to be disclosed to the buyer and they are not granted any extension on that. So if you sell this on the last day of the seventh year when you're supposed to have this retrofit done, this new owner is going to be in violation of that. So it's a very important part of disclosing that and uh, again that was a, an agreement that we worked out with the Association of Realtors as we were going through that and uh, one that they unanimously supported okay and then uh, the next uh, this is a comment uh, you mentioned earlier that um, you had a team of bankers coming in and do a presentation and that uh, they're willing to comply with uh, with what products they had to sell but there's nothing special and I would recommend that only because I used to be myself a commercial um, and residential uh, uh, lending broker and branch manager that you encourage a team, a steering committee to come up with a special program because there's a lot of money out there, a lot of bankers that are sitting waiting for business to come to them, but I would encourage you to just you know, throw it out there and challenge them to come up with a special product to help some of these people because obviously from sitting here listening to some of these uh, landlords and owners that might have some uh, down the road some uh, challenges with the how to finance, uh, I think if there was something very special, there's things right now, programs for example, that are unique for low income where they don't pay for their down payment and it's all given to them uh, as long as they have good credit and when they go to sell that's when they pay uh, which is great but something like this would be nice if you can just throw it out there to the bankers because the bankers are right now sitting waiting for business and uh, and I think uh, somebody is going to have to come up if they're smart enough and uh, talented enough to come up with something very creative to help a lot of these landlords mm -hmm. thank you Thank you, and that's an excellent that's an excellent point. Um, about a year ago, we put together a task force. Um, so if you'd like to be involved in that, please see me after. I'd be happy to add that to you. Uh, the Earthquake Safety Working Group has a financial subcommittee that is made up uh, not just with our partnering lenders, but also people from the Office of Public Finance in the in the city uh, city's office, as well as other property owners and real estate agents and people that are part of this this industry um, to make sure that we are guiding this correctly. So if you'd like to be involved, we welcome your participation. Hi, my name is Julio Nieto with Anderson Nis Wonder Seismic Retrofit Construction. Um, I have a question for the building department. Um, understanding that all the work is in the uh, garage areas of the buildings, and now that the homeowners, the building owners know that they uh, will reimburse the tenants for the parking, for parking somewhere else, um, I think that they are going to probably going to putting more pressure onto us as a contractors to um, get the work done on schedule. And is the building department ready or prepared to comply with the, all these inspections that are going to be? Yeah, yeah that's a good question. At the same I, mean, time? I mean, we're making these projects a priority in plan check, inspection. We'll have the manpower. If you call, we'll send somebody out there. We won't make you wait 
for an inspection. Yeah, because as a so right now the uh, scheduling schedule is about a week out. So having all this work, you know, coming, I hope they don't come all at the same time, no, but. No, we're making this a priority. I mean, Patrick is pushing it. Tom understands this. We're making this a priority. If you and call for an inspection, we'll be out there. And for us, it's we won't, we won't to keep. Uh, if you, we, won't, we won't be the cause of your delay. Okay, good. Because for us, it's very important to keep our deadline. I understand, I understand. We're making this a Thank priority. You. Allison Chaplow, I'm a broker and owner. So I have two questions. The first one revolves around Section 8. It's my understanding on rent control. We have a number of buildings with high uh, population of Section 8, but they're not subject to any pass-through. Is that correct? Correct. So, But they are subject to eviction controls. Can you explain what you mean by the second part? If you, for some, somebody asked earlier, we may need to relocate our tenants or, um, on a temporary basis, and if you have tenants who are Section 8 voucher holders, um, you would need a just cost to temporarily get possession of their units. So I understand that. So if the work's going to take longer than six months, though, HUD removes the contract. And so my question is in regards to that, that the person is then permanently relocated? So I'm not sure the, I understand the question. So HUD, recently on one of our units, the work was going to take longer than six months, which mm -hmm. structural work can take longer than six months, extensive. Um, they removed the HUD contract. They said they would no longer honor it because it was longer than six months, mm -hmm. the work. So. I'm not aware of that. Okay. Good Just, question. Yeah. And then the second question is in regards to disclosures. So you earlier said that buildings that fall under three stories I'm oh, sorry, they are absolutely soft story, but are under four units. For purposes of disclosure, they are not part of this program. So their 3R will not show it. Let me make sure I understand the correct question correctly. You're saying if it's four units or less, there's no disclosure requirement? Yes, that's correct. And they're absolutely not going to be in the program in the future? Not under this program. Um, the city ha is looking at options of retrofitting smaller buildings, but again, like anything uh, that we do with public policy around seismic retrofit, we'd have to talk to the community and have extensive meetings to really understand the repercussions. Uh, to give you an idea, to get to where we're at with this ordinance, we've been talking about this with the community for 10 years, so this is nothing new. Um, so looking at those, obviously it's a, it's a smaller group of property owners, it's a, they're different circumstances, uh, so we'd have to understand those uniquely and have a clear plan for addressing them before we would do any kind of public uh, our manda mandatory program around those buildings. Okay, and then regarding the 3R for the 5 plus, mm -hmm. how long do we think it's going to take to update it to make a proper disclosure? It's going to be a little confusing for the next year because until the screening process is done, we don't know. Um, so that's why I would encourage if someone's thinking about selling their building, it's going to behoove you to actually complete the screening form, which is which should take an engineer, you know, practically 20 minutes or so to complete unless you have a very unique situation. Um, but then that way you can at least get your screening program to say, yes, I'm in or out of the program. It makes it much more clear for disclosure. If you were to do that without submitting a screening form, you would just be labeled as someone who was noticed and is in the program until other evidence has been shown. Okay, so on the 3R, it'll be noticed that you're in the program. Once you submit the screening, you'll either be removed from your 3R or mm -hmm. compliant, like right under it, the energy? Exactly. So it would either say, yes, it's in the program, you're Tier 3, you have this long to comply, or okay. screening form was submitted, and there's no, I mean, there's, there's different terminology used in that, Perfect. but that's basically what it'd be saying is that, yeah, we've received the screening form, we've reviewed it, and you're out of the program. Okay, great. Thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. I have a rent board question regarding the tenant's hardship application mm -hmm. out of uh, all just because someone applies doesn't mean they're going to get it. Of all the applications you receive, what percentage get denied? I actually have that information at the office. I don't have it here, but more than you would think. The new criteria for capital improvement hardship is much clearer. And For example, um, you either have to be a recipient of means-tested public assistance or your gross household income is less than 80% of the current unadjusted median income and your rent charged is greater than 33% of your gross household income and there's a certain limit to your assets. So the criteria are much clearer. Um, I don't think the prior statistics as to what's granted or denied would necessarily apply. Right to the earthquake retrofit. Not necessarily, yes. Uh, hello, Sean Tracy, uh, Fastnet Engineering and Construction. Um, I got a couple of questions, I think, for 
uh, Patrick and uh, Robert. Uh, regarding the AB094 seismic upgrade, mandatory upgrade, the um, cost of the building permit, the deduction in cost of that, has that not expired now or is that still in, in, in process? AB94 is the voluntary one? Yes. It's in effect if you have you know less than five units. Right. And it waives the permit fees. Is that still in process? It's still in effect for five for less than five units. Okay. Um, we've done probably five of these, um, and we have come across uh, issues with the construction process on these buildings. Not only are you dealing with the seismic upgrade and the foundation work and what what's entailed in that, but also um, plumbing, electrical, uh, dry rot repair. So. Um, we had to get extra permits to for for the plumbing, electrical, and dry rot repair, and that was not wa the permit fee was not waived under zero ninety four. Uh, the homeowners couldn't really understand why that wouldn't be under the zero ninety four, even though it has got to do with the. What, what uh, was the purpose of the plumbing work? Was it extra? Uh, it, was, it, it was. It was. It uh, was. You know, because the plumbing was through the walls that we had okay. to uh, retrofit. The electrical was through the walls we had to retrofit. Uh, should that not be included in the permit um, deduction? So the plumbing work was related to the yes. Okay, why don't why don't you give me the address later, and I can I can look into it for you later after the meeting. Can we can we huddle? I can get the address from you. Uh, yes, fine. And, and then we can we can look into. There's that. also been some issue with um, a sidewalk um, encroachment uh -huh. um, that had to be repaired or you know put in. Uh, um, drains underneath the garage doors and all that kind of stuff. So I think. All this construction should be incorporated in the permit deduction because it has got to do with the construction. Let's see if Patrick has anything. Sure. So um, an another thing to clarify, uh, for those who are doing retrofits on buildings with fewer than five units on the voluntary basis using AB94, it's very important that you're very clear in the application that you are applying AB94 in your scope of work on your pink application. Now that said, AB94 doesn't have the same limitations that the mandatory program has. So if you, unfortunately, I know you run into this stuff when you're in the field, you don't know it ahead of time, but if you do know it ahead of time and it is shown on that permit for AB94, I think that's a, a cleaner way to tie it together. Um, I know Robert and his team can work hard to try to resolve the issue that you just explained, but I think to try to avoid that in the future, that's one way that you can do it to be proactive, to try to get as many of those fixes on there. I know you don't understand it until you actually get out there and rip out a wall, but um, that's hopefully uh, some constellation there. Right, and the other question is, um, I see you guys come up with a, a square foot price or a cost for these uh, retrofits. Um, I was at the meeting on, was it Wednesday evening, the mm -hmm. finance meeting? And I talked to somebody, I think from your department, um, and they said their cost was like 18 to $23 a square foot is the cost I was given. I have not seen that figure. The figure that we have been using is uh, an average cost of 60 to $130,000. And how that cost came about was part of the Community Action Plan for Seismic Safety Study, uh, where they took uh, several different examples of these buildings and how they look in San Francisco and what the wall configuration is. And they applied several different retrofit solutions to these example buildings. And then they ran detailed construction estimates to come up with the cost. So that's the range, a very average range. Now, obviously, San Francisco is a unique place, and you may have buildings that are cheaper than buildings Buildings that are more expensive really depends on the on the the particular building, but the range is, is somewhere in there. Yeah. And are you um, intending to uh, appoint um, specific inspectors in the future instead of depending on the building inspectors on on, on site? Because I know they're busy with all whatever else they have going on. Um, like the other gentleman brought up, like time is a, an issue for us. Uh, I think if you appointed uh, specific inspectors for the retrofit process, it would make it a lot more streamlined for everybody. You know, you have probably, you say 6,000 buildings, it's probably realistic, it's probably double that in the city. Yeah, I, I think we're going to have to huddle with Tom and Patrick. Mm -hmm. That's something we might go to. Uh, we, in, under, we understand the importance of the inspection. In previous discussions, um, you know, Deputy, Dan, Deputy Director Dan Lowry at the Building Department, uh, who's doing a phenomenal job of managing his staff over there, has indicated that his dis district field ins uh, inspectors feel they can handle that workload. But that said, if that becomes a problem, there's been provisions in the budget to add additional inspectors specifically for this program. We just haven't seen a need demonstrated yet. Now, if that happens, we can always activate those provisions and, and act accordingly. Hi, my name is Peter Chen. I'm a realtor. I know from experience that the hardest thing in a real estate transaction is getting a loan. I don't think that's going to be a problem with uh, property owners, but I do believe that there will be a small minority 
of uh, some property owners that will be denied a loan. What about these people? And denied a loan because of bad credit or because of? They have all kinds of reasons these days. Mm -hmm. uh, I know from experience mm -hmm. that getting a loan is the most difficult part of a real estate transaction uh, these days, even with people with great credit and great income. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that uh, a building with the equity, if they have equity in a building, I think that won't be a problem. But there are some people that still are paying off their loan on the, on the property they own right now. So in that case, they have to get secondary financing, mm -hmm. and they may not get it. And I think that's exactly why we took a comprehensive approach to this, as opposed to saying we are going to do one program, everybody has to try to fit in that program. If you don't, sorry. Uh, we have a lot of options on the table. And you know, to, to address the situation of someone, like you said, who, who, who has good income and good credit and is not uh, what a bank would normally consider a risk, there should not be that problem existing in the marketplace because we have so many people coming to the table. Now, the, you talk about the, 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 you know, the building that's falling apart, the owner that's neglecting it, they have terrible credit, they've been foreclosed. I mean, that's a situation that we can't address and we can't fix. So that's a, that's a different side. But the people who are, who are diligently trying to retrofit and, and comply with these standards, uh, we, can, we can help them to that effect as long as, uh, as, long as they're working within the, the framework that we need to work with here. I had a question. I have a building on uh, Dolores Street. And uh, I just wonder what tier the building would fall into. It's a full basement on the first floor, four garages. The second and third and fourth, or the three floors above, uh, consisting of six units, all identical. Would a building like that be exempt? Or what, if not, what tier would it fall into? Based on what you describe, it sounds like a tier three building. Um, but again, it'd have to be verified by an engineer. And whether or not you'd have to retrofit, that's a separate question. Um, placing in the tier would, would basically be the, the function of the screening process. Uh, but as far as your design and what your walls look like and what the condition of the building is, that would be the, the engineer's uh, suggestion after that. Do okay. you want anything to add anything to that, David? Well, the, just that the screening form instructions include a flow chart that help you answer exactly that question. Okay. And would you uh, start with an engineer, a structural engineer? To, to get to this point, or would you uh, deal with an architect? For the screening form, you yeah. can use an architect or an engineer. Uh, when you go to the design, the retrofit, it's, some architects are, are um, eligible to do this work, but generally it's engineers. Even structural engineers have to practice, they have to work within their own experience. So uh, a civil engineer is licensed to do this work, but might spend most of his time doing piping design and dams, and you know they are not really versed in structural design. So that's something for you to keep in mind. The licensure is one thing, but even anyone who is licensed has to practice within their own experience. And uh, what type of plants are required? There are no plants. There's an older building from 1926. Would, at the first step, would they have to submit drawings or? Uh... Yeah, you would need drawings, architectural plans, structural plans, calculations. Uh -huh. Those are outlined in an administrative bulletin 106, mm -hmm. okay. which, which, as you get into this, these administrative bulletins, they exist to help moderate the discussions between your design professional and the building department. So you may not want to read AB 106 or AB 107 when it's ready, because they're full of technical details and answer all these questions mm -hmm. so that, to help guide your design professional in working with the department. Hello, my name is Tom Kelly. I have uh, an 18-unit building that has poles, I mean, it's underneath parking and then extending over. Can I close off the parking? Could you close off the parking? Yes, but you would, again, as we talked about earlier, you know, when people talk to the planning department about their review, that would be considered exterior work. So it would take longer uh, to process the permit. So what you could do is there's a couple of options. You could design a retrofit without in that infill and then proceed that way. Or if you wanted to actually show whatever your new facade would look like, your new exterior, you could do that, but it would require full review would, by the planning it's department. It's cheaper to put a foundation straight across and frame it. Mm -hmm. and it, but it I could shorten it a little bit, the parking, because I have a little overhang, so I can shorten the parking and still make it, I think, mm -hmm. but I'll have my engineer look at it. You well, can do that, though, huh? change the parking. I have parking for them, but it'd be outside parking. Mm -hmm. it, would just, it would just complicate the permit process okay. further, I believe. The question may be, are you allowed to get no. better parking spaces? Uh, uh, to answer your question, you better check with planning. 
Generally, they don't allow you to reduce parking, but for your specific case, talk to planning. Well, I'm near park, so now you allow them no parking. <laughs> no, there are lots of ways to retrofit the building well, instead of filling up the hole. But I just, it's just easy, it's cheaper to I know. just pour a foundation. Thank you. Thank you. You, you need a foundation uh, if you use a, a frame as well. The typical solutions around, I mean, what we know about these buildings is that the reason they're vulnerable is because they have wide open parking spaces. So we, we know that. And therefore, solutions have developed both in Northern California and in Southern California for working around this. And those engineering solutions can avoid blocking parking spaces by using a steel frame around the openings. That's commonly done. Other innovative solutions are also being developed. If there are no further questions, ladies and gentlemen, then I think uh, we'll wrap this up. We will uh, be posting on the DBI and the ESLIP uh, websites uh, when we have another one uh, scheduled. Uh, we are looking into, as we said earlier, an evening one, probably from 6 until 8. But thank you very much for your attention, and uh, do call the building department if you have questions. <laughs>